Good morning, Pastor Josh. Thank you for joining me today to answer some interview questions. So firstly, how are you doing these days, Pastor Josh? What is new? All right, thank you, uh, Sharon, for the uh, good question. Yes, there has been some changes in our life. Um, it's basically started from our, we noticed that uh, my health has been getting worse and uh, just getting a bit too serious to ignore um, my physical health and uh, my mental health as well last uh, a few months. And uh, you know, and I decide to do something about it so that we can stay in the ministry longer and uh, um, yeah, to find a way to be healthy. Um, if you know my condition, it is just uh, a lot to do with the uh, environment, stress environment, um, and then how we do the ministry. So we choose, decide to do, uh, move out of our Eastwood house and uh, go to a place where we can rest, but also continue to do ministry. And the last sabbatical, uh, I was staying in Lungong for a few months and Yuna was visiting me and it was a dis uh, like not too far, and the drivable distance, and I could operate in, my, in the ministry there and our children staying in uh, Sydney, going to school. And, and so we decided to set it up in such a way that uh, I could go to uh, Wulungong and come up to Sydney uh, a few days and Yuna comes down to Wulungong a few days. And so we bring some balance uh, in our life. Um, yeah, it's been about three weeks. Uh, we've been doing really well. That setup has been really helpful. And I, we could see the significant improvement for my health as well. So just that's the new, that's the biggest changes in our life. And how is your family doing with your move to Wollongong? Can we hear more about how you and Yuna are doing? Yeah, so I think that question is the best to be answered by Yuna. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we, you know, made these big life changes, we made that in consultation and blessing from our children. And, you know, as a family, um, we thought about what's, what's our priorities and, you know, um, you know, what's important to us as a whole. And we felt that this was uh, the best way to go for at least for now. And, you know, kids have um, adjusted to the new way of life in our um, Epping apartment and they're doing really well. And yeah, and I've enjoyed uh, going down to Wollongong and having some rest there with Josh as well. So yeah, it's been good. It's been good. So, um, and I guess my uh, main concern when people hear about this has been that people would question, you know, is our marriage on the rocks and things like that. And I really want to assure everyone that we're really happily married still and that, you know, we get, um, we're happy to do this together. It was a, it was a mutual um, decision with all of four of us making that decision together. And so we've done uh, quite well in this adjustment period as well. And um, our future, we feel, is bright and um, we'll be okay. And finally, I heard that we're on the search for a new Sydney campus pastor. That's so exciting. Now, what does this mean for you? And does this mean that you will be leaving Heartbeat? Okay, I think that's very... Um timely question also I need to answer that clearly today um, no I'm not leaving we are not planning to leave this new uh, pastor we're trying to bring it in is an addition it's not replacement and this is very important for you to understand and now uh, the health issue that I'm dealing with is quite serious matter and Yuna and I felt we gotta uh, help the church to continue on this house church ministry journey and uh, reaching out to the Lord and the last and the least and I can't do it alone and that's a simple the the decision and I brought that up to the leadership and the leadership acknowledged that and so it's an exciting time on that in that sense yeah I mean it's been um, something that's been tried before and it really is a sustainability issue that you know Josh can't be looking after three campuses by himself so um, to make this more sustainable uh, we do really need this help so it is an exciting 
um, season? Yeah, we want a, a pastor who is more present in Sydney campus, and Sydney campus is able to provide a full-time pastor uh, financially and all ready to do it. So this is why we're doing it. And now this difference is, is that the, we have a search committee and our leaderships are more involved in finding the people. We're going to take the steps to do it. And also and uh, our members will have a chance to say to that. So search committee will come up with a short list. Shepherds will bring the one candidate and, and uh, you get to choose and say yes or no to the person. So yeah, take it as a like a really exciting uh, season for all of us and hopefully God bring a right person to to partner with our uh, journey as well. Yeah. Okay, so don't worry. Well, we are here. We are here to stay. Well, um, having said all this, I'd like to make one more announcement um, through this uh, COVID season is being a bit finishing off now and uh, the place of worship has opened. But uh, still, we are struggling to get the approval from school to, to, um, to allow us to have a Sunday service in Sydney campus. Yeah, so the school hasn't opened up yet, and which makes it uh, challenging for us to meet. Um, and we don't want to change times and change venues again. So in the meantime, uh, we're asking house churches to gather together and worship together, just fellowship together as well, so that you know, you resume that community life again in some way. Yeah, so please contact your shepherds. If you don't have house church, let me know and come together on Sunday as house church. And that is actually vision. It's a good opportunity for us to really live out that house church, the lifestyle. So yeah, it's starting from next week, uh, first week of November and until the, the school has opened, the, the, uh, give us the permission. To, to resume our Sunday face-to-face -face service in Sydney campus. All right, so, okay. How about I just uh, pray and uh, pray for the, the, the message and uh, pray for you guys. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time and thank you for the, this great season, new season that you have given to us. And Lord God, there are many concerns and worries and thoughts, Lord, I pray, Lord, you cover us. You cover us with your assurance, with your love, with your plan, with your, uh, you, with your power, Lord God, so that we can continue to rely on you. I pray that you bless those people who gave generously and also the pray that this message will penetrate people's heart and truly come to the place where we find your love and grace once again and be encouraged by you, Lord God. Thank you for today. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, enjoy the message. Good morning, Happy Church. How are you all doing? It's so good to have you here this morning. I know it's been hard for many of you listening to online sermon uh, for many months now. I know many of you guys telling me they're struggling to focus. But church, can I ask you to pay attention? Pay attention and make it intentional choices for next every Sunday in front of the TV or computer. Just pay attention because this is important. Very, very important, crucial message for all of us. Before I go any further, I just want to talk about the, what we've been preaching so far. I know it is quite intense, hurtful sometimes. And last week's sermon was extra long. And my wife says, why are you putting two sermons in one Sunday? And some of you probably feeling that, why Pastor Joshua would make me think that I'm not a Christian? We may not be a Christian. Why is he saying that it's not pleasant to hear that? Why does he keep saying things like that? But I mean, the bottom line is this. I'm not saying it. Bible is saying it. I literally try to reiterate what Bible says, what Apostle John says, and in my best way I could. Apostle John is saying that you are fooling yourself. You say you believe in God, but you're not. You're a liar. 
You are lying, meaning that someone is fooling you. Who is fooling you? Yourself. Or there are people telling you otherwise, telling you that it's okay to be like that. It is okay to just you know, be a religious person. Like whatever that is, Apostle John is making it very clear that you may not be saved. And it is actually good if you are get offended. It's way better that you get offended and made you think and get just like who gets so angry at me or and John and whatever because that means you're taking seriously. Worst thing is that you're hearing or not even hearing it. You're half hearing it with all the distraction going on around you and you miss this whole series. Okay, today's message is continuation of from last two weeks. And we're going to focus on something very, very very important. Right? It starts like this. Chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. When it says see, in other version it says behold. It simply means observe. Take a look. Today, we need to take a look at His love, God's love. You know, many say that you know, when we marry to a person a long time, and you have a more of like brotherlyhood rather than romance, rather than romantic love. You know, I reject that from all my heart. My wife knows it. I, I let her know that. That's not how we're going to pray for the rest of the journey. But why do you say these things like because if, as if it is true? I think it's because we are good at taking things for granted and loses the power or loses the grip on that precious thing that you only realize when you, after you lose it. Even God's love, you can take it for granted. The moment you're starting to not to see, behold. Meaning that the moment that you lose the ability to be fascinated by the love of God. And the Christianity becomes a completely different thing. You just don't know how to sing anymore. You don't know how to be so close to God anymore. You just don't know how to fill with the love of God in your heart anymore and you replace it with a ministry, replace it with the other organizational things and or other uh, the the things of the world. You know why do we do EMP and prayer meeting? Because we want to sit there and gaze upon his beauty, gaze upon God's love. I want you to really stop that attitude of coming to God with that uh, with a genie in the lamp holding in your hands and just rub it and you get what you want. If that's all you have in your Christian understanding, there's no submission, there's no obedience, there's no listening, there's no gazing. There's a serious issue. You wish you stop doing that or you may never have a relationship with God at first place. When was the last time you truly broke down by the power of love of God? When was the last time you just thought about that your heart aches because, oh my goodness, I can't believe He loves me that much. And it's so powerful for you because the fact that He loved you, the fact that He is loving you, the fact that He will love you, the way He loves you. Have you ever gazed upon something beautiful in your life? You stop and look at it. Right? And this is where the true relationship is confirmed and affirmed. Like, my, like for example, the husband and wife. 
they need to sometimes stop and just look at each other and each other become the biggest agenda they have. It's not about mortgage they pay. It's not about the children. It's not about the, what kind of job you have. No, no, no. It's at the end of the day, it is about one person loving another. What is that? That is the fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah? That's what uh, the first chapter 1, chapter 2 constantly talking about. You need to have fellowship with God. And don't fool yourself. Don't lie to yourself. When you don't have that fellowship, and there are evidence that you will find out, you can identify in your life, when you don't have a fellowship, and there are things that you can identify, that you can see that you have a fellowship. So that's the first checkpoint. If you've never been marveled at God's love in your life, you've been coming to church a long time, but now there was never a point in your life, that you are amazed by His love. It's always about you. It was always been about your health, wealth, and wise. That's nothing wrong with that. Everybody wants it. But when it comes to God, you didn't have a relationship with God. You never really understand the love of God upon your life. That's the first checkpoint. It's either you have never been His children of God um, at, at first place, or you haven't, haven't seen the depth of your undeservedness to be loved by God. My personal moments when I remember that I became a Christian, it was kind of that moment. Up until then, I agreed with uh, Christian values and ideas, but never really impressed by God's love. When someone says, God loves you, I'll think, oh yeah, good. So, so what else new? And what else is there? I've been coming to church all my life. I hear in there, you know, every day, literally, I'm born in Christian uh, the, the value and message all around. Yeah, God loves me. That's good. That's His job, right? Sometimes I have that kind of attitude with my parents. And, yeah, that's your job to love me. No, it's not their job to love me. No, they don't have to love me. You don't deserve that love. And that moment you realize you're on deservedness, the moment you think, oh my God, Goodness, I can't believe you love me. Person like me, that's when true relationship starts. Have you ever had that kind of moment in your life? Have you ever experienced that everything in this world dim out and you just stand there alone between God and you and let Him fascinate you? Let Him struck by this, this awesome love He has for you. See, as I get older, I start to see my weakness, my evil desire, sinful thought more and more. When I was young, I thought I was innocent. You know, they, they, all this you know, the biblical truth was not really real to me. But when I went through my own darkest hours, when I walked through the valley of shadow of death, when I see my evilness, sinfulness, and look at God, and He says, look at the cross. I get marveled. I get just wondered. I mean, why? <laughs> why do you love me like that? You don't have to. See, this is what Apostle John says. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. What kind of love is it? He goes on saying that we should be called children of God. So we are. So that we can be called children of God. There's another point here. God does not just want to save you, but God wants you to be His child. Do you see the differences? Okay, you can be saved by firemen, or you can be saved by a life save, a lifeguard, or you can be saved by financial help. You can be saved from many things. God can save you, you can go to heaven, but you can end up being the doorkeeper or servant and slave in His kingdom, right? 
Salvation is not just about being saved and going to heaven. Salvation, Bible talks about, is about you becoming His child, His son. Now, when you put it like that, it completely makes sense to me. And it completely real to me what love God has for me. See, um, uh, uh, the John, Gospel of John 1 says, 12, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what happened was that when I believed in Jesus, I became a child of God. And God says, look, this is how much I love you. I fully get it now when I became a father. When I became a father, when I look at my children, I'm not expecting anything back from them. I just want to have a fellowship with them. I just want to have a relationship with them. I want them to know that they are my children. I want them to know they are loved by me. I want them to live right and pursue their dreams. And I want them to enjoy this life that, that, that they have here because I'm a father. And every good desire, that intention I have towards my children, God has that for me, for all of you. That is His grand plan for all of us. Becoming His children is a deeper understanding of salvation. He called us to be His children, the children of God. But now, the next verse confuses you. And there's a level of confusion here. I understand why. Because we say God is love, and next verse straight away talks about sin. And saying you are not in God. You are not of God. You are not children of God. Okay, let me read to you. Okay? This is why you need to listen very carefully. Don't get fooled. Don't get confused. Don't just like the idea of being loved by God, but truly be loved by God, right? So what verse 4 says is that everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. See, if you keep on sinning, if you're living the life is so away from God's desire, or if you have a, there's no intention in your life to live like the, uh, the way God wants you to live, then you are not. You haven't seen Him. You don't know Him. Even if you say you know Him, even if you say that you have a fellowship with Him, you're not a liar. You're not saved. You're not going to heaven. Where are you going then? See, sin is the is essential ingredient for you to understand God's love. I don't want you just to just feel like being loved by God. I want you to truly be loved by God because He's your Father. But some of you may not be His children at all because you are keep on sinning here. Practice of sinning. Practice of sinning. Okay. As we said last week, it's not about you never sin. It's not about you being perfect. No. We are becoming perfect. No, I sin too. You sin. But what is it talking about here? It's talking about that there is no intention in your life to, to live the righteous life or there is no remorse over the sin that you have. There is no existence of Holy Spirit condemning you and convicting you. And there is no voice that you are hearing you're just so fine with the people the way people living, and you say, well, that's what everybody does. That's what everybody does. See, verse 7, he goes on saying this. Listen, little children, all right? 
little children, let no one deceive you. Again, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this. John is saying it. Someone is deceiving you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, and the devil has been sinning from the beginning. See, so simple, so simple. If you are righteous, and, and you practice righteous, then you are righteous. And you are not, then you are sinning, then you are of the devil. You are not children of God. The reason the Son of God appears was to destroy the works of the devil. I can preach on this next time, but just keep, let, I mean, let me keep going. No one born of God, okay, no one born of God, make a practice of sinning. For God's seed abide in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So what happens if you keep on sinning? If you keep on sinning, I'm not again talking about your weakness. I'm not talking about your mistake. I'm not talking about your uh, your battling and struggling. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people who are constantly sinning. Even the Bible keep on talking about that. And what is that then? Then you are not of God. No, you're not born of God. Meaning you're not children of God. You're not. You're not going to heaven. Then where are you going? Yeah? By, okay, by this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Now, you can't get even clearer than that. You can't get even more clear than this. By this, this is evident. This is a sign who are children of God and who are the children of the devil. Okay, you, you discern yourself, right? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, there are many things, there are many things that you probably stumble when you hear this message, about this passage. Practicing righteousness. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good in certain part, but I'm not good in certain way. I'm still dealing with my anger issue, my pride issue, my jealousy issue. So, I mean, there are too many things wrong in my life. And how then, then is, am I of devil? Okay, no, no, listen carefully. What he's saying is next verse. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. It's so immediately connecting righteousness and the loving others. Just two things connected up. It gets stronger. Chris Sandor, the way that the, the passage after this. But let's pause a bit, a bit. Let's pause a bit. Are you listening? The Holy Spirit right now? Is Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? I need you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. It's not about Joshua speaking to you. It's got nothing to do with me. It's about Bible straight away giving it to you. Because some of you, some of you deceiving yourself or being deceived by something around you. Maybe religion or the church activity you've been coming or something rather. And that's the reason why your heart is so hardened and you never re re experienced the love of God. You never really cried. Because those, God's love is so amazing. You never really felt that heart of God. And that you, you experienced the heart, your heart being skipped because you can't believe He loves me this much. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and discern and read it for yourself. Yeah? So what is saying, what is the righteousness he's talking about? In next verse, he goes on, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Okay, now, they are talking about Old Testament, how Cain and uh, killed his own brother. And then, and then it was not really loving thing to do, of course. Okay, very simplistic, the, the explanation, but we'll come back later. What he's trying to say. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. He killed his brother because he was sinful. He's evil. He's of devil. He's not of God. Verse 13. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Now he's talking to Christians. Now 
No, he's talking to the Christian right now. Because you are children of God, now you should understand, because you pass out of death into life, this Old Testament analogy, right? And because of that, and we love our brother, and also the other way around, because we love brother, you know that you are the children of God. Okay, listen carefully. It's not you become children of God because you love someone. No. Love other loving others is not the cause, it's a sign, but it's a definite sign. It's a clear, it's the mark of discipleship. If you miss that out, you miss out everything. Bible just constantly talks about that again, again, again. Now it gets even clearer, even get deeper and really straightforward to you like this. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Do you want to say it differently? If you hate your brother, I'm talking about not your Immediate brother, not family brother, but brothers in Christ. Everyone who hates his brother, then you are the person who actually killing the person like Cain did in Old Testament. And if you are, keep on hating. If you're making the practice of hating, if you acknowledge, if you, if that, if you just, have no remorse and have no uh, repentance in your heart over that and you keep on doing it, it's like no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You're not going to heaven. If you're not going to heaven, where are you going? Yeah. Let me say this. Bible talks about love, not an option. It's not an option, guys. I know it's hard to love people. I know it's not easy to love people. But do you know that? Do you know? You can actually do Christian, Christian life. You can do church. You can build this organization with your organizational skill management and leadership skill, run church, even pastor, without love? Yeah. You can do all this without any love in you. You can be also very successful. You can memorize verses in the Bible. You can even preach from it without love. We can lead songs, worship, Without love. It is possible. Even, even you can prophesy over others. And the uh, one uh, the first Corinthians 13 says you can't even sacrifice for others without love. And without love, you are nothing. Without love, just nothing makes any sense. Everything that we do. Everything that we do in God's name, it's meaningless. But there's a point that I need to make here. Whenever God talks about love, why is He bring up the sin? Because for us to understand the love, you need to understand. And you never get God's love until you understand how undeserved we are to be loved by God. See, there's a reason why you never get marveled at His love. There's a reason why you never get saved. Because you don't need God at first place. You think you're a good person. Yep, you think you're an okay person. Right? You think that you are, you've done enough. And 
yeah, idea of going to heaven is good. So I signed that paper. I tick the boxes. I subscribe the heavenly YouTube so I can go to heaven. If that is where you are and it is important for you to be brutally honest to yourself. Do you truly have fellowship with God? And how do you have a fellowship with God? You stand before God naked. You stand before God the way you get rid of your title, get rid of your 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 reputations, your credential, whatever that is, you before God, who are you? And have you ever faced God and let his love struck you? See, one of the popular beliefs that many people secretly having is this universalism saying that you know at the end of that i think everybody will get go to heaven right because god is love god is love yeah so it is good to be nice you know being nice being kind but do you know it's actually jesus who said excommunicate excommunicate some people who do not listening uh, to the truth Go to, go to the person, rebuke and doesn't listen and bring another person if he doesn't listen and bring to the church if he doesn't listen and just treat him like someone who does not know God belongs to God. Because to Jesus, it's far better for you to get humiliated and that get rejected by men so that you can, at the end of the day, accept it by God through your repentance and humility. See, When God, when Bible says God is love, doesn't mean that love is God. Because when Bible says God is love, it talks about the price that God has paid to love you. It talks about the, the ugly, the dark, that, that the sinful, dirty stuff that God has to deal with to love you. And you are sitting there, taking it for granted, feeling that like you deserve the, the, His love and you never, you never truly enjoy God's love because you never needed it in the first place. Next verse will tell you, what's the reality of love of God look like? What's the reality of love? Of God looks like verse 16 by this we know love by this we know this is what love is I don't care what kind of definition you come from to have yeah what is love for you is a feeling is that just being nice to people or being kind it's about Disneyland right it's a lot of the Mickey Mouse running around you know that that kind of a uh, the fantasy love all right no no biblical love is this okay by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Why do I feel so... struck by the love of God? Bible says He died for me. God died for me. This God actually died for me. Do you, do you get that? This King of Kings and Lord of Lords, this, this most beautiful thing that ever exists, all oh, this wonderful the creator of the universe, died for me. Who am I? Who, who, who the heck am I before God? And He actually loved me. It just doesn't make sense for me. It just doesn't make sense for me in my state of my sickness, my sinfulness, and my, um, my mistakes, and uh, my flaws, and my depressions. And when I bring it before God, you know, I think my wife loves me because I've been hiding it well. If she sees my heart of a heart, I don't think anybody can love me. But this God, He knows me. He sees me. He look at me the deep inside my heart and He said, but I died for you. And it just can't comprehensive for me. And I look at His love today. And I'm asking you to behold His love today. 
then you will get what I am saying, what the Apostle John is trying to say to you. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So when we talk about loving your brother, it's not just about God bless you. It's not just about I see you on Sunday. You know, I remember that when we start house church, some of you really struggle. The fact that we are meeting one more day of the week, Friday night, meeting to just talk about God and what has happened so, you know, throughout the week to pray for each other. It's just too bothersome. It's too, uh, too, too, too hard for you. I, I remember some of you were struggling with that. See, 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 that's not love. That's not love. Love is not just convenient things that you do. Love is not the, the just hanging out with the people that you like to hang out with. Love is not just uh, doing things that you like to do and uh, having people that have the same hobby as you. If you truly love by God, He died for you, you understand that. Then you, Bible says, you ought to lay down your lives for the brothers. For the last 25 years of ministry, I'm telling you, I've been the, the leader of the pastor or founder of the ministry that was much larger than Harpeet. I had people followed me and told me that how good preacher I am. And I did all sorts of the praises and all sorts of exciting things. But I've seen it. Trust me on that. I'm not being boastful here today. But you know what? Deep inside my heart, I always felt that something is not quite right. That some of them are lying. They don't even know they are lying. They don't even know they are being deceived because there is no love. There is a love for the success of the ministry. There is a love for the excitement that people bring in in that group. But there is no genuine love for God. The love for God in their life so that they can sacrifice their love for others. There is no sacrifice. There is no obedience. See? Even Hitler had followers. Even Hitler had made people to do the things he wanted them to do. It was crazy. All the communism, all the political leaders. But we are different, aren't we? We are different. Why are we doing house church? Because this is, I feel, you know, all these years, it's not overstatement. The church that we have, although we are not big, it is most healthy stage. You struggling? I know you're struggling, guys. I know you're wrestling with the big things here and there. I know some of you guys couldn't do it anymore because it's too hard on you. But what I'm saying is that you are struggling with the right thing. You're struggling with the, the things that God that matters to God. And at least you're not lying to yourself. At least you're not being blinded by the human success anymore. It's all about you coming into the place together and obeying this word that God is speaking over and over and over and over again. You read the Bible. Please read the Bible. Please read the Bible. If I'm saying the lie, I'm saying truth or not, Jesus said, the Apostle Paul said, Apostle John saying it, you love others because you are loved by God. It's so simple logic. In verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. God's love was never was about just word or talk. Yeah? When was the last time that you actually spent your money for others? All right? When was the last time you know you're giving it to someone simply because? Not that they deserve, not because... Um, you want to show your righteousness? No, because you know what you receive from God is way more, way bigger. Hmm. Today's verse is very clear, very straightforward. If you love someone, you lay down 
your reputation, your possession, your position, your pride. Because you love the person. Do we have that amongst us? Do you have that in your life? So, okay. Now, how do we get there? How do we get there? I'm not talking about social uh, justice kind of gospel here. No, no, no. Where do we start? You have to start from the place of being received. The love of God. You have to do all this the state of overflow. You have to start from verse 1. Look. Behold. Behold. Habit. I want to plead with you. I want to plead with you. Let's stop pretending or faking or deceiving ourselves. When you search your heart, you know that there is no true faith in you. Then come to God. Come to God today. Let the Holy Spirit convict you. Come to God. It is good that you know finally you know that you need God in your life. That's good. Come in repentance. And ask God to show His love for you. Ask Holy Spirit to, to let God's love be so ob obvious for you. Okay, and for those who are in Christ, but keep on sinning. You gotta repent, man. You gotta repent. Why I keep doing that? Bible says that there's a confusion in there. You know, don't don't let your heart be troubled when you live with this, uh, this uh, was a fight in your heart listen to the Holy Spirit you're playing with a fire you're playing with a, there's something very very dangerous there for those people who are discouraged deflated feel overstretched by doing God's work or dis, dis, uh, um, depressed Come and behold His love. Come and behold His love. There are love songs in the world that romanticize love. We are all one love. We don't necessarily love God, but we sometimes just want the love from God. See, Richard Mark says, Until the day ocean touched the sand, I'll be your man. Celine Dion says, My heart will go on. But all the love songs sang by the one who did nothing to you, at the end of the day, it was just words and thoughts. But Apostle Paul said, God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the love song that Bible sings. Hope this love song makes you to stop and behold. And let your heart be skipped some heartbeat here and there. And this love song not only save you, but also be make you to love like He loves us. Let's pray. Okay, can I ask the praise team to come out in Gold Coast Campus and get ready? And for the rest of you, just get ready in front of the TV or screen. Before this next song is a place, and I want you to get ready your heart. Do you understand the passage that's spoken to you today? Do you? Does the love of God inspire your heart? And it gives you that joy and that, that, that marvelous appreciation about who God is. Is love of God real to you? Let's start from there. Let's start from there. If you have never experienced His love, today is the time to sit in His presence and ask God, Come God, speak to me. Talk to me. Let me know. Tell me this is true that you love me. What you've done on the cross through Jesus is for me. And I am 
called to be saved and to become your children. If we been keep on sinning, repent before the Lord because you are dealing with far greater, far more dangerous than you think. You think you know. If you keep on hating your brothers, you don't know what you dealing with here. See, let's bring it out before God and ask God's help. Ask Holy Spirit to take charge, take control over our life, our hearts, our environment for the next few minutes while we sing this song together. Let's do this.
Okay, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the conviction. Thank you for the revelation through the word, Lord God. I thank you for making us, making me, your son, when I don't deserve, when I don't even acknowledge that your love for us, you yet, when I was a sinner, you died for us. And Father, help all of the people who repented in their heart. Give them the courage and strength to ask for the forgiveness people around them they hated or they struggled with. Give them the strength to love them. And I pray, Lord God, let the people learn how to stand before you. Stand before the presence of God and receive from you more than anything, Lord God. Let all of us restore the ability to be fascinated by the love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the amazing sacrifice you made for us. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give God a big club offering. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, so good to have you here. Hopefully, uh, I can see you next time. Uh, thank you for coming. Why don't you come to EMP or you know, early morning prayer? We are actually doing late night prayer now. I will announce it next week, officially in November. Uh, but please, find the presence of God regularly where you can be marveled at the love of God. Okay? Where you can just behold His love upon you it will change your life you change your life you know i'm always there i'm always in the mp if you want to hear my sermon or message and prayer i'm always there so um we can be still connected in every way all right all right so let me give you a benediction may the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all now and forever and everyone says amen amen let's give god a big club offering yay have a great week guys